just say they gave me nothing to do for a year, but I was always meeting him on the set, on the uh, sure. lot, and he would say, hello, Greer, when are you going to start? When are they going to give you a big starring vehicle? When am I going to be your leading man? And this would pep me up for another two months or so, and the months dragged by, and finally, there was a script sent to me that I thought Walter was wonderful for, nobody else should play it. And it was a picture in color, and you directed it. It was all about orphans and Texans and things. Blossoms in the Dust. Blossoms in the Dust. Okay, yeah. the title, Blossoms in the Dust. Was that the one that, that did it That was the one you? that did it, yes. While Betty Davis was sitting quite comfortably on the throne of Hollywood, there was an actress who would very quickly take over this position. While Betty, however, needed some time to find an audience and success, things went rather smoothly for Greer Garson. If you don't count that year, she sat around in Hollywood waiting for MGM to find the right role for her. I had to wait for a year and I went nearly mad with hope deferred. I got awfully tired of being taken to watch other people's previews and things. I was, I was geared for work. And all an actor has is time, lifetime, and energy. An actor's terribly dependent on circumstances. You cannot... A painter can go up to the attic and paint a picture. A writer can be in the garret and write a book. An actor's a thing of naught. He's in limbo, unless he has a stage and a production. And an audience. <laughs> but, uh, or a set and a production. You, you, you're at the mercy of c fate, casting directors. Parts written, books written, whatever. But after her introduction to moviegoers in Goodbye Mr. Chips, she quickly became the dominant screen actress of the 40s, equaling Betty Davis's record of five Best Actress nominations in a row and becoming MGM's major prestige dramatic actress. At the beginning of this reign stands Blossoms in the Dust, an important step in her career as it established the kind of roles she would have to play again and again, restarted her love affair with the Academy, and also began a, like Greer Garson herself, not truly iconic, but still fondly remembered movie partnership. After Goodbye Mr. Chips, things initially did not look too bright for Greer Garson. Her follow-up vehicle, the romantic comedy Remember opposite Robert Taylor, did not copy the magic of her previous success. Bosley Crowther wrote in the New York Times, for the spectacle of a charming actress, Trying desperately to make good, doing the things her employers unaccountably want her to do, we refer you to Greer Garson in Remember. Greer Garson herself referred to Remember as Forgive and Forget, and suddenly it seemed that she might go the way of another MGM prestige actress, with whom she would even share a set in Blossoms in the Dust, and whose career was basically over the moment it had started. This is a terrible! However, things improved very quickly with Greer Garson's next vehicle. Pride and Prejudice opposite Laurence Olivier. If critics had dismissed her for Remember, they were carrying her on their shoulders now and stated that if Vivian Lee was born to play Scarlett O'Hara, then Greer Garson was just as born to play Elizabeth Bennet. Bosley Crowther was also much kinder this time, stating that Elizabeth Bennet stepped right out of the book, and audiences loved Pride and Prejudice as well. Energized by the success, Louis B. Mayer, head of MGM, immediately began to look for her next prestige project, when he read a screenplay called Blossoms in the Dust, a story about the real-life campaigner for children's rights, Edna Gladney. With its focus on a selfless hero who gives her life to support children in need, Blossoms in the Dust was MGM's attempt to copy the success of its 1938 Spencer Tracy production Boys Town, and was considered the perfect vehicle to display Greer Garson's talents. Edna Gladney herself, still very much alive at this point, was invited to Hollywood to help with the script and historic details. Greer remembered, When I first read the script for Blossoms in the Dust, I rather jibed at doing it. I felt it was too similar to Mrs. Chips and that I should have a chance to prove versatility. But when I learned that Mrs. Gladney herself had expressed the wish that I played a part, I was so flattered. I was speechless. Thank you. That's sweet. Despite being based on a true story and even the involvement of Edna Gladney herself, the film was still considered largely fictitious, with various events of Edna's life altered for the sake of entertainment. However, Greer was still thrilled with her task, stating, Portraying a living person on the screen is the most exciting experience an actress can have. At first I was a bit frightened. It is a responsibility to represent a woman like Mrs. Gladney whose many years devoted to child welfare have made her one of America's great humanitarians. Despite her initial doubts, doing Blossoms in the Dust turned into one of Greer Garson's happiest memories in the end. 
She visited Edna Gladney's hometown Fort Worth in Texas on various occasions for the rest of her life and remained closely connected with her. Continuing to draw attention to her work and cause after her death in 1961 and in 1965, attended the first annual Blossoms in the Dust luncheon, which raised funds to the Edna Gladney home. And Blossoms in the Dust was also special for Greer Garson, because it marked the first time that she appeared opposite Walter Pidgeon, with whom she would co-star in seven more movies during her career. Oh, a darling man, a darling man. Was he really? Because I oh, never... Oh, a darling uh. man, a solid gold gentleman. We made seven pictures together, seven and a half. We won't talk about the half, it was a clinker. But we made seven pictures together and we never had an insecure thought about each other or a, an angry crossword or a tiff or anything like that. It was the most wonderful partnership, wonderful friendship. In fact, Walter Pidgeon was Greer Garson's on-screen partner four years in a row in the movies that won her Oscar nominations. And he probably could have been a fifth time as well if Gregory Peck had not appeared on the scene. Walter and Greer had an instantly relaxed relationship on the set, playing practical jokes on each other and admiring each other's talents. For Walter Pidgeon, 1941 was an important year as well. After many rather forgettable parts, the MGM player finally found more success when he was loaned out in 1941 and starred in John Ford's Oscar winner How Green Was My Valley and Fritz Lang's Manhunt. When he returned to MGM for Blossoms in the Dust, he was a star on his own right and the pairing with Greer Garson gave his career another push. And he would receive two Best Actor nominations in the next years for his work opposite her, becoming one of MGM's most popular names thanks to his association with Greer, which he called one of the happiest of a lifetime. I have no idea, except that we seemed like a couple of decent people, I suppose, I really don't know. <laughs> Most of the uh, characters we were given to play were kind of normal, decent people. Some of them emerged into greatness. And uh, I think Walter had such... Well, he was just such a manly man. He was the solid gold gentleman. Blossoms in the Dust had a special premiere in Fort Worth and also played in New York at Radio City Music Hall. Some critics complained that the movie was too sentimental and that director Mervyn Leroy did not fully realize the potential of the story, but most of them loved the picture, calling it powerful, deeply moving and one of the most heart-touching ever brought to the screen. Like with the movie itself, some critics also found few things to enjoy in Greer Garson's work stating that she has little to display except virtue, noble instincts and a kind heart which guides her through a life story that seems pretty dull. But everyone else loved her, calling Greer's performance superior to her Mrs. Chips, commanding her dynamic spirit and overall stating that, quite simply, it's been a long time since so great a performance has been afforded in a movie. And on top of that, Variety said that, even at this early date, there will be many who will insist that the Academy Award for the 1941-42 season is already settled. Special attention was also given to the movie's Technicolor achievements. In fact, Blossoms in the Dust was a color picture specifically to highlight Greer Garson's hair and the media extensively covered how this affected the shooting and how sets and costumes all had to be adjusted to look natural in a color picture and to flatter Greer Garson's looks. And it was apparently worth it, as the movie won the Oscar for its color art direction and Walter Winchell later said that Technicolor was made for Greer Garson. Did you shoot Blossoms in the Dust in Texas, any part of it in Texas? No, no, we created a little bit of Texas on the back lot. That, those magic back lots, you know. So sorry, they sold for real estate now and so on, a lot of dull commercial things like that. They were magic. Edna Gladney herself was also pleased with the movie, writing to Mayer that I am grateful for the recognition that this picture will give to our cause. She did not mention Greer's performance on this occasion, but it's easy to believe that she was more than happy with her portrayal, which gave Edna strength, compassion, humanity and never-ending kindness. But is this enough for a compelling performance? Well, one thing has to be said right away. As usual, Greer Garson displays a vitality, aliveness and charm in her performance that does set her apart from many other actresses of her era. And it is always a joy to watch her, as she plays her roles with an almost infectious positivity that shines through the screen. In the case of Blossoms in the Dust, 
This however cannot hide the fact that she feels a bit too old in the beginning of the movie, more like a loving aunt than an older sister, despite Greer's attempts to be as coquettish and useful as possible. Beyond that, you will also be hard pressed to find an actress that radiates Britishness more distinctly than Greer Garson. I am certainly no expert on dialects in the English language, but I don't really get the impression that Greer's Edna is from Wisconsin, no matter what newspaper said in 1941. Is this the way they dance in Texas? But I'm going to have five sons and five daughters. And even if Greer Garson carries the story effectively, it's hard to deny that she is held back by the script that prevents her from giving a more thought out characterization. Blossoms in the Dust rushes through too many of the important milestones of Edna's life, often simply showing results but never processes. But even these results never come alive in Greer Garson's performance. Events such as the death of her sister, the death of her husband and the death of her child come and go without affecting Edna's personality at all, making the audience basically forget all these characters the moment they left the screen because her performance forgets them as well, lacking an overarching development. My baby's dead, Sam. My baby's dead. Max! Max! And even in Edna's most important mission in her life, helping children, the movie never truly finds the right approach. Her orphanage occasionally feels like a drive through where lonely couples can pick up children within an hour, denying Greer Garson to build a real connection to Edna's priorities. Her most important decision, to fight against the word illegitimate, feels too unfocused and her final success earns an almost bored reaction from Greer Garson, letting the moment feel far less triumphant than expected. The ordeal's over. Birth certificate bill passed by healthy majority. What most appears to affect and limit Greer Garson's work is a clear adoration for the real life Edna Gladney, and maybe the pressure to give a performance that stands up to the general idealization of her achievements. Go on to Austin, Mrs. Gladney, and God bless you. Therefore, everything about the movie and her performance feels a bit too noble, a bit too important. This is most clear in her big speech near the end. While effective, Greer Garson's delivery and body language too much feel like an actress moving and speaking the way she thinks she is supposed to move and speak for the sake of a message, but not in alliance with her character. Oh, believe me, gentlemen, there are no illegitimate babies. There are only illegitimate parents. And even while the relationship between Greer Garson and Walter Pitchen is fondly remembered, it is not as memorable as many other famous on-screen partnerships. They obviously work together nicely and Greer's first rejection of his advances is entertaining to watch. But their chemistry is never an important part of Blossoms in the Dust, or many of their other collaborations. In most of their movies together, Walter Pitchen played second fiddle to Greer Garson, often leaving the picture midway or simply supporting her quietly in the background. Their dynamic never felt essential to the stories, which were mostly completely tailored around Greer Garson. Walter Pitchen was certainly a good sport in handing these movies to his co-star, knowing who the audience primarily wanted to see, but the movies never feel like a battle of equals, which is what makes couples like Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn, or Rock Hudson and Doris Day, or many others that we still remember today, far more intriguing to watch and to remember. Women just adore him because, they, you know, he's still what they admire and like, it seemed like a very reliable gent, which indeed he was, and handsome and charming and a great sense of humor. Very naughty. <laughs> um, tell me terrible naughty limericks just at the last minute before we're going to turn the camera on a serious scene. And I would be determined not to crack. However, I don't want to dismiss Greer Garson's work too strongly. She feels more misdirected than anything else, not given too many chances, as the movie seems to think that her presence is enough to make the story a success and Edna a memorable character. But there are moments when Greer digs a bit deeper than the script allows, mostly when she lets Edna be surprisingly selfish or doesn't exaggerate the sentimentality of the moment. It's a kitty of good family, darling, whose mother's found it impossible to earn her own living. We might protect her. Get that child out of here. So it is a performance that maybe doesn't create an overall successful characterization, but is always watchable, satisfying and touching. 
It makes it understandable why Blossoms in the Dust is the movie that began Greer Garson's maybe short, but impressive reign in Hollywood. The success of Blossoms in the Dust was, however, a blessing and a curse for Greer Garson, as she rightfully feared that Maya was setting her up as the eternal supportive wife, a role from which she would never escape. Already in 1942, she stated in interviews that, I'm developing an allergy to the term lady. Nothing but lady, lady and more lady has been my fate ever since Mr. Chips. The Greer Garson lady is something just too too, with a halo of nobility. I'd like to take her by the scruff of her neck and drop her neatly into the Pacific Ocean. But what can I do? I'm doomed. Look for the clear light of truth. Look for unknown. New roads. I was known at that time as MGM, and that was glorified Mrs. <laughs> <laughs> I had played Mrs. This and Mrs. That and Mrs. Something. For an actress with this level of success, this might sound like hyperbole, but it is understandable that she was frustrated with the roles MGM was offering to her and that audiences wanted to see her in. Vincent Camby later wrote, in her high-toned MGM pictures, she was invariably serene polite, elegant, in a slightly unreal way, too good to be true, always prepared to meet any emergency and staunchly middle class. But she was stuck with the part she had created in Goodbye Mr. Chips and then continued in Blossoms in the Dust, the noble, elegant woman slash wife who suffers gracefully to overcome any obstacles, an archetype she would repeat again and again in future roles. But these other parts, other successes and failures of her career are a topic for another time. Instead, let's move on to the most famous or infamous nominees in this year's lineup.